The last of our panel speakers just before lunch, which is Yuichi Lu. She's currently a PhD student in the English department at the University of Southampton. Her project is a comparative study between Hardy and the Chinese writer Shen Kongwen. And she focuses on the relationship between nature and humanity in their novels while applying a Taoist conception of ecological being to her textual analyses of these two writers. Uh, thank you so much for having me here today. It's really my honor to stand here and pay my tribute to Thomas Hardy. And uh, I'm Yue Jie Liu, that's the pronunciation of my name, and you can just call me Liu. And uh, this is the second year of my PhD study here, in, uh, no, not here, in, in the University of Southampton. And uh, my project is a comparative study between Thomas Hardy and Shen Chongwen, the Chinese writer. And today I will present to you part of the chapter two in my thesis. It's about the conception of nature in the woodlanders and the border town. Uh, so uh, the book covers I choose here uh, are personally my favorites. And this one is, a, is an audio book found on the website, and that one is a newly published The Border Town uh, in 2009. Uh, so immediately we can see the contrast between uh, the Western oil painting and uh, the traditional Chinese ink painting. And uh, still we can feel there's a kind of parallel between the isolation of the landscape, landscapes in the novels, that uh, the, 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 the figure of the human beings, maybe you can't see clearly here, this is actually a river and, and a ferry. So uh, all the human beings are quite tiny, and uh, in contrast to the, to, the, to the nature, to the landscape. Uh, so I, I think that this is a point of my, my comparative study, that although the, the methods, the techniques, or the style can be different for two writers from two different cultures, as a reader, we can still feel something that is, that is similar in the flavor. So uh, Hardy classifies his novels into three categories in the general preface to the Wessex edition of 1912. Novels of character and environment, romances and fantasies, and novels of ingenuity. All his major novels fall into the first category, though how to define major is debatable. That Hardy as a novelist is most well known for the first group is beyond doubt. Richard H. Taylor claims that the classification itself can reveal why reception of each group differs. Quote, the category themselves, which suggest a deeper understanding of the exact nature of his own fiction than is often attributed to Hardy, go some way to explaining why certain of these novels elicit less response than others. It is exactly the psychic interplay of character and environment that sustains the reader's deeper interest in the major novels. And while this is not absent from the others, the, the effect is muted by other factors, end quote. So Taylor here asserts an important distinction of Hardy's novels, but he does not specify how this psychic interplay of characters and the environment manifests in the texts and why it can sustain the reader's interest, except for some exotic reading experience. So in this presentation, uh, a distinct conception of nature that Hardy and Shen show in their novels is compared to that of Taoism, a traditional Chinese philosophy, with examples of the woodlanders and the border town. Mm, Shen Chongwen, as shown in this photo, in, in the photo it, it was taken in uh, the, the captions here saying that Shen Chongwen in Peking uh, before the, the second Sino-Japan War. So, actually, so the, the time of this photo is around 1935 uh, to 1937. And Shen Chongwen is one of the most important 
more than Chinese writers, with a focus on regional culture and identity in his writing. He was nominated for the 1988 Nobel Prize in Literature, but died before he could be awarded the prize. He was a very prolific writer, producing more than 20 volumes of prose and fiction between 1933 and 1937. His early work includes lyric poems, one-act dramas, essays, and short stories. He stopped writing fiction in 1949 and started writing scholarly nonfiction volumes about calligraphy, art history, museum pre preservation, and other topics relevant to the history of Chinese art and culture. The Border Town, uh, published first in 1934, is Shen's most famous novella. So here, I list some uh, information about the comparison I'm going to make in this uh, presentation. The Border Town was published in 1934, and the setting of the Border Town, Cha Dong, the name of the little town there, uh, is, is a town in West Hunan province. So, um, oh, I, can't, I can't really touch that, but you can see that uh, West Hunan province is abbreviated as Xiangxi in Chinese. Actually, Hunan is abbreviated as, as Xiang, and Xi means West. So Xiangxi is the name for the region in, this, in, this, uh, in the real geography and also in the fictional world. And, and the followings are some characters that are comparable in these two novels, and I'm going to show you in the following presentation. The Border Town tells a love story among three young people. On the border between Sichuan and the Hunan provinces lies the small town Chadong, where an old ferryman and his orphan granddaughter Emerald live by the river. The man in charge of the docks has two sons, Tianbao and Nuo Song, who help with his business. Nuo Song meets Emerald in a dragon boat festival, and they are attracted to each other. Later, Tianbao, the elder brother, also falls in love with Emerald and asks a matchmaker to propose marriage. Meanwhile, a local landlord proposes a match between Nuo Song, the younger brother, and his daughter. Nuo Song is still in love with Emerald, and the two brothers decide to follow the local custom and sing love songs to the Emerald so that she can choose between them. Knowing that Nuo Song has already won Emerald's heart, Tianbao, goes, Tianbao, the elder brother, goes on a trip in depression and dies in an accident on water. Nuo Song and his father feel upset about the old ferryman's elusive and attentive attitude. To, uh, which gives both brothers hope of marriage with Emerald and leads to the final tragedy. Annoyed by their misunderstanding and indifference, as well as feeling gloomy about Emerald's future, the old, uh, the old ferryman dies. Nuo Song exiles himself from the border town in confusion, leaving Emerald waiting for him at the ferry. So a film adaptation was released in 1984, and Shen, as showed in this snapshot, uh, he also took part in the making of this film uh, before he died in 1988. So he actually uh, revised the script and met with the actors. So uh, I think that what the film shows that uh, about the local environment, the local customs, and the story is very close to Shen's imagination. Uh, so I take some snapshots of, from the film in order to give you an impression of the local environment. So this is a river. Can you see it clearly? So this is a river by which the the grandfather and Emerald live by. And just a, an over, overall impression of the Xiangxi region. And this is, the, this is their household and the ferry. The old ferryman and Emerald. And Emerald meets the younger brother in a dragon boat festival. The two brothers. And this is the very last thing where, where Emerald is waiting for 
his, her lover to come, come back. According to Shen's introduction in the preface, the time of this story is around 1914. By the time Shen wrote the story, he was teaching in a city far away from his hometown in Xiangxi. The border town is widely regarded as a pastoral canon. Shen states in the preface that, quote, this work was designed as a little hut with little building material and taking little space. I hope it is economical but not short of fresh air and sunshine. What I initially wanted to show was a form of being, a form of being that is graceful, healthy, natural, and not against humanity. I did not wish to lead the readers to track a utopia, but I wish to make a footnote about the love of humankind with several ordinary people in a small town near Yushui Valley, who are connected by an incident and will assume their portions of happiness and sorrow, end quote. So this, this paragraph was translated by myself, so please bear with my English. And, and Shen intends to depict the beauty of humanity intensively in this novella, but not without a foreshadowing of modernity. The language in the border town is poetic. The, descri the description of Emerald is one of the most vivid in the novella. Quote, wind and sun have tanned the growing girl's skin. Her eyes resting on green hills are as clear as crystal. Nature is her mother and teacher, making her innocent, lively, and untamed as some small wild creature. She has the gentleness of a fawn and seems not to know the meaning of cruelty, anxiety, or anger. Should a stranger on the ferry stare at her, she fixes her brilliant eyes on him as if ready to fly any instant to the mountains. But once she knows no harm is meant, she finishes her task calmly." End quote. The settings in the border town are different from a merely human society. Nature defines humanity instead of nature defined by humanity. The border town can also be regarded as a novel of character and environment in which humanity and nature are in a reciprocal relationship. Ian Greger compares D.H. Lawrence with Thomas Hardy to show that the dualism existing in Lawrence is absent in Hardy. Quote, for Hardy, no such dichotomy presented itself. If nature consisted in the life of things, it consisted no less in the laws man made to govern the life of things, end quote. Gregor points out two forces at war in Lawrence, social and personal judgment. For social judgment, Gregor means prevailing social and moral codes. And for personal judgment, he means by their own souls which is natural, hum, natural human, humanity. He claims that for Hardy, both social, and, social judgment and natural humanity are subject to nature. Nature here is a metaphysical and universal law as the imminent will claimed by Hardy. Gregor reveals Hardy's distinct connect, con, conception of nature, which differs from the dualistic paradigm of man versus nature. But his argument misses the melancholia about human beings' fate in the novels of Hardy, which is also distinct. The acceptance of things as they are is in line with nature when it accords with natural humanity. However, acceptance of things like grace changeability or Giles' death is different. It is far-fetching to assert that Hardy shows the same resignation in face of the two scenarios. In the first, there can be a relief, while in the second, the acceptance is accompanied by frustration. The second scenario is the one in which Hardy thinks tragedy comes into being. Hardy writes in his notebook in, in November 1885, as I quoted here, because Professor Millet has already mentioned this one, but I, I feel just I feel the need to stress it again, so please bear with me. Quote, 
tragedy it may be put thus in brief, a tragedy exhibits a state of things in the life of an individual which unavoidably causes some natural aim or desires of his to end in a catastrophe when, when carried out, end quote. Meanwhile, Shen comments on the border town that, every, quote, everything was full of goodness and goodwill. However, everything was also untimely and inopportune. And thus, plain goodness and innocent hope inevitably lead to tragedy, end quote. It is, first of all, a natural aim or goodwill, which is then bended by untimely and inopportune incidents that makes a tragedy. And the untimely incidents do include natural disasters, like the storm on Bathsheba's farm in Far From the Madding Crowd, or the flood in the border town. But it, but it also triggers acceptance with the knowing that nature is unfathomable, which is totally different from the acceptance of Giles' death in a storm or the elder brother's death during the sailing, sailing in the border town. There is something unnatural in these incidents that cannot be accepted with resignation because nature is only neutral. It is social or emotional factors that have caused these tragic deaths. There is a monism between nature and natural humanity, which is shown as an acceptance of things as they are by characters like Giles and the old ferryman. However, social judgment is not included in, which, in this, which finally causes their death. For Shen, humanity is not something only carved by culture. It is in contact with nature always in the flow and is generated from within rather than enlightened by certain ideology. It is a vitality of life itself. Shen's idealization of, of humanity is based on a belief in the sustainability of nature. There is also a melancholia permeating the border town. Shen leaves the question in the end. The future is uncertain. Similarly, the ending of the Woodlanders foreshadows a bitter marriage and a great complete break with the woodland. The ceaseless circle of life, the source of natural humanity, seems to cease. The sustainability of nature becomes questionable because natural humanity is contaminated by social judgments. Shen claims his thought as Neo Taoism in one essay. His emphasis is on a form of being that is connected with the life of things and uh, the kind of being that is sensitive to the flow of life. Taoism is a traditional Chinese philosophy that stresses heaven and man merging into one. Chapter 25 of Dao De Jing, a Taoist classic states that, quote, the ways of men are conditioned by those of earth, the ways of earth by those of heaven, the ways of heaven by those of Tao, and the ways of Tao by the self-soul. The direct translation for nature in Chinese is self-soul, meaning being what it, what it is, and Tao means the way. Tao is a metaphysical form of nature, the oneness contained in heaven, earth, and man. The philosophy has a tremendous impact on Chinese aesthetics. The deep appreciation of natural beauty and the feeling of oneness have always centered Chinese intellectual pursuit. Taoism has three elements about the relationship between man and nature. Heaven, earth, and man. Heaven is the beginning of everything. Earth the mother of everything, man, realization of everything. Taoism asserts heaven and man as complementary in heaven and man merging into one. Thus, neither man nor nature is the center. Tao is, and it connects everything. A Taoist eco-criticism is about decentralization. The definition of this metaphysical Tao is now the focus of my thesis. Neither Hardy nor Shen has generated any philosophy or metaphysics about the meaning of life. What's in focus is the monism of nature and natural humanity in Taoism, which is also shown in these novels. John Patterson examines the influence of Hardy on D. H. Lawrence and concludes that their views of nature, quote, 
Man was not, after all, the chief environment of man. Man was related to the universe in some religious way, even prior to his relations to his fellow man. It was not enough that the novelist be a writer of books of manners. He had to realize the tremendous non-human quality of life, the existence of a natural cosmos that had more to offer of glory and of glamour than the vulgar world of men and things, end quote. Patterson asserts that Hardy shows a natural humanity that is defined by nature rather than by social relations. Similarly, John Alcorn uses naturist to define Hardy's intuitive awareness of nature. Alcorn suggests that for Hardy, the monism of nature and humanity is unconscious or subconscious, which is also what Taoism suggests about Tao. Alcorn actually propels a Taoist understanding of Hardy. Quote, his characters, like the tiny figures in the immense spaces of a Chinese screen painting, or like the grasshopper-sized Klim Ubright cutting furs, are themselves part of the landscape. And it can be quickly understood by a student of Zen or of the Tao, end quote. So Elkhorn here reveals a possibility of a Taoist approach to Hardy's nature, the obliteration of the subject I observed by Elkhorn in Hardy's novels is part of the decentralization of humanity in Taoism. The key word for Taoist decentralization is connection. Connection between subjects and objects. As discussed by Elkhorn, connection between humankind and the life of things as a psychic interplay between characters and nature claimed, claimed, claimed by Taylor, and connection between humanity and nature, which is shown through characterization in relation to nature claimed by Patterson. All these connections show a Taoist decentralization in Hardy's ancient novels. Um, due to the time limit, I don't have the time to present you the, a detailed analysis of the text, which is the main body of my thesis, and in which I will uh, show the, that both Hardy and Shen demonstrate a monism between natural humanity and nature through analogies that blend human and non-human beings. They depict a rural community that is attuned to the rhythm of nature and the sensory feelings of sound and gaze in their novels interact humanity with nature, which eliminates the division between subject and object. A decentralized eco-criticism is demonstrated and a melancholia over the loss of the monism between nature and humanity is implied in the tones of the woodlanders and the border town. So finally, I want to show you part of the first chapter in the border town, as shown there. Uh, mm, maybe you don't have time to read it. And uh, I just want to say that the narrative of uh, this, uh, this environment and the custom of, uh, of the, the border town just can easily remind all the Chinese readers of a classical Chinese poem, as shown here. Uh, I'll read it to you. It drizzles endless during the raining season in spring. Travelers along the road look gloomy and miserable. When I ask a shepherd boy where I can find a tavern, he points at a distant hamlet nestling amidst apricot blossoms. So actually the, the rhymes of the Chinese language is lost here. But still you can feel the, the temperament of a raining day and a lonely stranger for an for enclosed town, and the ease of that, that buffalo boy, and there's a, there's a human habitat hidden in the background of the, the vast nature. So uh, a Chinese painting, as mentioned by Alcorn, is shown here. It is based on the poem I read, and also I think the poem can can have links with the Shen's narrative there. So all, both, all, the, all of them, Shen's, Shen's fiction, the poem, and this painting all show uh, a, 
a, a vast landscape that human habitat and activities are so interwoven with nature that they are rendered almost invisible. And this is what I mean by Taoist aesthetics and what I want to explore in both Hardy's and, and Shen's novels. Thank you so much.